arm being about 100 and the other 270 just being what you see here all the way to that far tree line uh, meadows woods whatnot they've been working pretty hard on it the last 17 years removing invasive species and planting native plants this is a rose hip, and I am the Roaming Rose researcher on the Rose Hip Road Trip. I have a rose between my hips, lowers on my lips, and I am hip to the power of plants. Each day, I chant to invoke their spirits. Can you hear it? The rose hip road trip. The this, rose hip hey everyone, rose hip this trip. is Dr. Hilary Booker, the roaming rogue researcher, and this is the rose hip road trip. This is real live research, and I'm really excited to be here with you today. So don't forget to put on your helmets, kids, because in this episode, I'm taking you on a literal ride through the pasture of Coverdale Farm in Wilmington, Delaware, on a mule. No, not the animal, but a favorite piece of farming equipment for anyone who's ever farmed. This is my first interview on the Rose Hip Road Trip. I first met Dave Lorem last July while helping my friends process their chickens. On a side note, I made a video about the chicken processing which is available on the Rosehip Road Trip blog as well as on the Institute for Earth-Based Living YouTube channel. I have to say that animal processing is one of those activities that brings people together. So I was excited to talk with Dave about his work at Coverdale Farm, which was one of the first sustainable farms I remember hearing about in the northern Delaware area. It's run by the Delaware Nature Society, which Dave will tell us more about during this interview. In addition to an interview, Dave took me on a tour of the farm. You too can take a tour of the farm by visiting the Institute for Earth-Based Living YouTube channel, a link to which you can find on the Rose Hip Road Trip blog. It's a gorgeous farm and you'll not only get to see rolling pasture, but you'll get to see the animals. This farm is also a wildlife preserve, so there are farm animals and animals native to this environment, which Dave will also discuss further. As always, thank you so much for listening, and don't forget to visit Road Hip, Ro Rose Hip Road Trip and Institute for Earth-Based Living on Facebook and Instagram. Have a great day. Okay, so Dave, the first question that I had for you is um, about what your job is here at the farm. What do you do here at Coverdale? My primary responsibility is the care of our livestock. Um, bovine, ovine, well, so cows, goats, sheep, heritage breed chickens, turkeys, um, what am I forgetting? Pigs, bees, and I believe those are all our animals. I'm also responsible for the grounds. Um, we have several acres of area that needs to be kept groomed. We do have several thousand visitors a year, so it looks has to look nice. Um, I'm also responsible for an 18-bed vegetable teaching garden. Okay, excellent. And this farm is connected to the Delaware Nature Society, is that correct? Yes, absolutely. And um, I am also responsible for facilitating educational programs so it's not like I'm just taking care of the animals for fun right. we, we use the animals in our teaching program so um, yeah yeah I work closely with our educators all right fantastic when you hear the term earth-based what is the first image that comes to mind earth-based I've never heard that term before um, I would guess holistic. Um, I'm thinking of it as a give and take with the earth, I guess. Okay. You want to harvest from the earth, but you also kind of want to protect it and sustain it. Mm -hmm. 
Earlier you said that your CSA is not organic, but as sustainable as it can be. Can you expand on that idea a little bit more? Well, the reason, the main reason we're not organic is there's just a lot of hoops to jump through. So when you say not organic, you mean you're not certified Certified organic, organic, right? We are not certified organic. So can you talk about the practices that you use and implement? Well, I'm not involved as much in the CSA as I am on this side of things with the livestock, but um, I know they use um, row covers, they use drip tape, um, irrigation, um, to cut down on water consumption. Um, again, with the black plastic, um, herbicide isn't nearly as essential. Um, yeah, so I think those are the two big, two biggies. Um, we start our own seeds and our seeds are organic certified. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's, okay. that's, those are the biggies, I think. All right. Um, how would you define what you do on a regular basis that brings you into relationship with the earth? Well, every day it's chores, um, (laughs) and the animals come from the earth. So you are constantly surrounded by life and death. Um, we, as I mentioned, we do have a healthy respect for wildlife here being a nature society. So, um, we do not get as upset when a red-tailed hawk takes one of our chickens um, as a more conventional farmer might be. Um, like right now, while we're talking, you know, I'm, I'm digging in the dirt, <laughs> <laughs> getting ready to plant some broccoli. Um, so every day I'm in this garden doing something, um, whether it's weeding or planting or harvesting. Um, yeah, I think that's... Okay. That's where my biggest connection comes from. Are there any other tasks that you have um, on the farm or other practices that you have either here at work on the farm or kind of outside of the farm that you haven't mentioned yet that you think are important to your understanding your own placement within the ecosystem? Yeah, I am responsible for our composting facility, so I do turn the compost as often as I can find time to. And I do spread that compost on our our hay fields. Um, um, So yeah, I hadn't mentioned that, I don't think. Um, And we do have, we do feel responsible to insects too. So we do let our milkweed grow. We do let certain weeds stick around that probably would be removed otherwise. Mm -hmm. And can you talk about the importance of letting the milkweed remain? Oh, well, we know that monarch monarch butterfly populations are diminishing, so this is just one way to help out in a small way. And we we can teach kids about it, too. This is why we keep milkweed, because it's helping helping our native pollinators. So how long have you been farming? On and off. When I, I I really mean on and off. Oh, no, no, it's fine. (laughs) Um... I started farming full-time on while I was in college. I worked full-time at the University of Delaware farm while I went to school part-time studying. And were you, yeah, what, what did you study? I was study? studying animal science, okay. uh, minoring in plant, plant biology also. Um, and then I was off farming. I was doing research for a university, and then I was on farming again. And what kind of research did you do? Oh, this and that. Uh, I studied laminitis in horses. I studied traumatic brain injury in children. I studied uh, all sorts of things. I helped manage a necropsy facility for a couple years at a veterinary school where I did um, animal autopsies every day. Um, Then I was at the United States National Zoo where I did the same thing. And I've been back farming for only about four months now. Okay. But I'd say over the last 15 years, I've spent maybe five of it or six of it farming. Okay. Um, and if I wasn't farming professionally, I was an avid gardener. Okay. And when did you start? Is that something that you just always did? Was it part of your life growing up or? It wasn't. My you get into it? My father grew up um, farming in Maine. So I was exposed to it sporadically, but no, I was your typical suburban kid. Okay. Went to school in a city and... Yeah. So what got you into it? 
be honest with you, I have no idea. No idea. It's in, I think it's innate in me. Like, I've always wanted to do it. Okay. I've always loved doing it. What made you want to do it? Did you have a moment where you're like, this is what I have to do? Well, when I started it, I, I had little to no knowledge of sustainable agriculture. I was more of a conventional type farmer, and that's okay. what I wanted to pursue. Um, and as I became more educated, I learned about things like permaculture and, and organic farming and uh, other ways to humanely raise livestock other than conventional. So that, that's definitely the direction I drifted. Um, it just made sense. Just because it made sense. Yeah, absolutely. Why did it, is there any particular reason why it makes sense? We well, just used the word humanely, so is there a certain level of connection? Well, I think everybody would like to see their animals. I think everybody should see their animals, how they're raised. Um, and if people want to imagine how they're raised, they want to imagine they're raised in a humane manner. Um, and unfortunately, that's not the case. But you also have to think about economics. You, have, you want to raise the animals as humanely as you can, but also still be able to be in the black. Right. Um, and that requires research and expertise and... Uh, and new ideas, new ways of thinking about how we raise our animals. And compromise. Yeah. Definitely. Why have you decided that this is the job that you want? Um, I've had enough jobs that I know this is what makes me happy. Okay. Um, I've had more prestigious jobs. So you're doing this jobs. because it makes you happy? Yeah. I've had more prestigious jobs. Um, I've had more secure jobs. I've had easier jobs. Um, so this is not extremely well paying it's not easy at all yeah i think anyone that's ever farmed will tell you that um i should say it's not lucrative right. <laughs> um and what makes me happy is you know helping animals treating sick animals um making things grow being able to provide a tangible item that people need um that's a big part of it not just data. <laughs> right. Um, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, it just feels good. Okay. Um, is there anything that you would change about what you're doing now or how you're doing it? Um, well, it's going to take time, but our management systems I want to change in, in almost every way. Okay. Um, that's our master plan: is to have regenerative agriculture. Um, Can you talk about pastured livestock? What regenerative agriculture is. Well, it can mean a lot of things. What when, does it mean when to we you? when we talk about it, it's um, you know um, I'm just trying to think how I want to say this. So, conservation and agriculture don't have to be mutually exclusive. You can use agriculture as a tool for conservation um, rather than you know cutting hay and selling it and shipping it off the farm you can put livestock on there and mimic you know the bison of the Great Plains um, they provide the fertilization they provide you know a product at the end of the day that people need and want um, you can use agriculture to improve soil quality, which would in turn improve insect populations, which would in turn improve bird populations. Um, and there's lots of ways you can go about it. Um, yeah, that's one example of regenerative okay. agriculture. Right. So you said you're making a list, regenerative agriculture, and then the next thing you were saying is pastured livestock. Yeah, pastured livestock. I mean, not to get too crazy, but, you know, 500 years ago, this whole area was eastern woodland bison. Yeah. You know, um, and you can use, done properly, livestock as a way to get back to that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you can improve water quality using livestock. You can improve topography um, using livestock. It has to be integrative. 
but would you say there's a relationship between how you understand um, the quality of land quality of water quality of air quality of topography and life of people living in this area with what you do yeah absolutely okay. absolutely I think we might be the only farm for several miles um, it's just houses so yeah. it's nice for people to have that in their lives yeah to be able to see it to be able to see it experience it okay maybe understand a little better right and is there anything that I have not asked you or that you haven't said that you feel would contribute to this research as you understand it I don't think so okay all right, awesome. I think we're good to go. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Yeah. And I am the Rolling Road Researcher on the Road Sip Road Trip. I have goddesses in my hips. I go to herbs to get my tips. And my food even makes fairies do flips. The Sip Road Trip. The Road Sip Road Trip. This is a rose hip, and I am the roaming road researcher on the rose hip road trip. I let the wind determine my cliff. I stay away from air with too much nip, and if you need some vitamin C, take a sip from my tea.